We are at the place in John 15 where Jesus has this conversation with his disciples about uh, him being the vine and us the branches. Jesus is going to make the statement, I am the true vine. I am the vine. And this is something that it's important for us to recognize that, to, that this would be known to the disciples, the people that he was speaking to, because this is something they've heard a lot in the Old Testament. So we're going to do a little bit of a reading to kind of demonstrate that and show you guys just how much and how bold this statement actually was. So if you were a first century Jew and heard for the first time that Jesus was the true vine and his people were the branches, you would have mixed emotions. On one hand, you would be quite familiar with the idea of comparing people to vines and vineyards. Your Bible, the Old Testament, frequently refers to Israel as being a vine that God planted. On the other hand, you would know the comparison was not a favorable one. You may have recited, Psalm 80. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. You would recall the words of Hosea who said that, Israel was a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. Israel's prosperity, unfortunately, led to increased idolatry. But the more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. You may have heard these words of Isaiah. Isaiah 5. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Jeremiah's words may have haunted you. I planted you in a choice vine from the purest stock. How then did you turn degenerate and become a wild vine? That would have reminded you of Ezekiel's chilling words spoken against Judah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I've given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So you see, when when Jesus starts speaking to his disciples and he says this statement, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser it would have landed right where it was supposed to in their heads. This is something they've been hearing from the prophets from their Bible for for a long time now. The twist would have been that Jesus was declaring he was. This is another one of his I am statements. He says, I am the true vine. And all of the, uh, uh, the word pictures that came before this, Israel was the vine. And Israel was a vine who, did you, could you pay attention? What, what was the main uh, complaint against Israel? It was supposed to be fruitful, but instead it went wild. And it produced wild grapes, which were bitter, which were no good. They, they, they couldn't be used. So, so this, this thing that was supposed to happen as God made a people and then brought them out of bondage of Egypt and planted them in a perfect place and, and cleared the land for them. And he is this, the father is this vine dresser or, or we would just say farmer who took care of him. But instead they rejected those boundaries. They went wild. But now Jesus is stating, actually, I am the true vine. All of the, all of the things that Israel was supposed to be, Jesus was. All of the mistakes that Israel made, all of the failures that we have all made, Jesus made none of those. He became the true vine and his father, the vine dresser or the the husbandman. So we'll keep on reading verse two as he describes more what this looks like. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch, and he withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And you see there, there are two different kinds of branches. 
There are fruitless branches and there are fruitful branches. And the difference between them is abiding. And the fruitless branches, they are, they're taken away, they're, they're burned, like they're, just, they're destroyed. And I think it's important for us to realize, like this is, a, this is a very bold statement, but God is looking for any opportunity to be able to, to reach us. Like any tiny little bit, like any kind of sign of life, any bit of attaching, and he wants to grow and he wants to develop that. Isaiah 42.3 says, A bruised reed he will not break, a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Anybody here ever tried to start a fire from nothing? You ever done that? You ever tried to start a fire from nothing? Anybody, any, I guess I'm asking, are there any Boy Scouts in the room? Right? I mean, there's no other good reason to try to just rub sticks together to start a fire. But if you've ever been in that situation where you tried to start a fire from nothing, you know it's very different than the way we typically. I don't know if your family was like my family, but when we went camping and you want to start a fire, you always had the gas can. <laughs> right? I mean, we were real woodsmen. <laughs> Why would you be caught out in the woods alone without a can of gas? <laughs> you just pour that all over, you know, whatever kindling you have, and then you stand way back and you throw a match. Uh, that's not the picture that we have here of Jesus. What we have here is Jesus seeing just a tiny little ember, just the tiniest spark. And what do you have to do when, you, when you're trying to start a fire from nothing? What do you have to do? You have to get in real close, right? Real close. And you have to be super gentle. And you just, you kind of just, and you just, barely feed, just a little bit of moss and a little bit more. That's the picture that we have of Jesus. That, that, that picture right there, a, a, a weekly burning wick, he'll not just blow it out. You call that life? Squash. The other picture he describes here is, is a brood, bruised reed. You know what a reed is. It's just this long, very thin weed. And if you just pinch it anywhere along that shaft, if you just pinch it, it'll just go doink. I just fall right over. Just like it just reminds me of Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, right? Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. Everyone, I don't know if you've rewatched those recently, but they're brutal, man. They're like, You're stupid, Charlie Brown. <laughs> like, wow, we don't say stuff like that to kids anymore. Stop. <laughs> they, you know that that idea. Like he's he's the Linus blanket. He comes around and he goes, No, no, no. This is life. Like we're not going to cut this off. We're going to kill this. I know sometimes when I hear this, I'm like, Man, I better bear fruit. If I don't bear fruit, I'm in trouble. And it's true. Fruitlessness is, is cut off and thrown away and, and burns in a fire because there is no life. But if you have a sign of life, then he's a good vine dresser. And he comes around and he binds that up and he feeds it and he waters it and he prunes it, which is also painful, and he, and, and he makes it grow more. I'll just, one, one more little word picture. Uh, I remember as a kid, I didn't understand this for the longest time until um, somebody did something silly for me. And, and, he, and he stood up and he said, hey, uh, trees don't, they're not out in the field doing this. Fruit. <laughs> he says, they don't strain at fruit. That's just not what they do. He says, pay attention uh, to the, the world that God made. What they're looking for is nutrients. They go down. They don't strain to go up. They go, they go down. They go to the light. They go to, to the nutrients. And then fruit is a byproduct of them being connected to health. And that really changed the way I thought about this whole fruitful thing. I'm like, yeah, sometimes I get the cart ahead of the horse and I think, I need to be fruitful. I need to produce some fruit. Instead of thinking, I need to abide. I need to be found in Jesus. So branches bear fruit through abiding. Our job if you can even call it a job, is to rest in Jesus. Our assignment isn't fruit primarily. Our assignment is abiding. From abiding comes fruit. If you get those two backwards, I know it can sound like, ah, oh, you're saying the same thing, but it's not the same. Matter of fact, one tends to leave you exhausted and in a state of legalism, and the other one kind of sets you free. I think this is really important for us to recognize just in the midst of American culture because we are saturated with this idea of bearing fruit. And I mean, if you notice, just even the way that we talk to each other, the first thing you say when you meet someone is, what do you do? 
and it's all about the outcome. And when we don't have that, it becomes an identity crisis unless we are abiding. So this, this concept, this thing that Jesus is talking about, coming and abiding and that being our source rather than the focus of fruit, this is a shift in paradigm for a lot of us. And it is really important for us to get it because the longer we're striving and we're trying and we're trying to do things right, we're, we're missing the mark. And something that can look good on the outside can actually just be bad fruit. It can... It's not fruit that lasts you for, for eternity. It's not eternal fruit. And so we, ha- we have to look at this like, no, the, the most important thing to be able to bear good fruit, to be able to be a good mother or father or to be able to do my job well isn't me striving, striving, striving. It is taking time to get alone with Christ mm-hmm. more than anything else. It is taking time to stop and to slow down and to get alone with Christ. In, in some ways, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is kind of the mirror passage to this because in the Sermon on the Mount, you have the, the longest sermon of Jesus recorded. And, and here you have the longest conversation of Jesus recorded. And in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, he describes it like this, in a really radical and, quite frankly, scary way. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You got to really look at this verse. You really do. You have to really look at it, because it feels like, now, wait a minute. These were fruitful people, but he's clearly saying here, they weren't doing my will, They weren't connected to me. They didn't know what I wanted. They weren't listening to me. And he says, I never knew you. Uh, Now, we're dealing with the God of the universe who knows everything, right? We all agree. There aren't things that God doesn't know. So if he says, I never knew you, what does he mean? Does he mean he he didn't recognize them? Like, now, your face looks familiar, but I just... No, he knows all the hairs on their head. He knows how many cells make up their body. If he says, I never knew you, he's talking about a relationship of abiding, right? And in scripture, you know, especially this Hebrew thought, there's a sense in which to know someone wasn't to just know their name or know them by reputation. Adam knew his wife. That was a very intimate knowing. That was an abiding, connecting knowing. We'll just stop right there because we'll stop right there. But that's the kind of knowing that God is describing. Like, I never knew you. You weren't abiding in me. We weren't actually connected. You were out there striving, and maybe some of the stuff you were doing was good, but guess what? Good stuff doesn't get us into heaven. Right? Good stuff doesn't get us into heaven. That's not how this works. Sorry. Oh, okay. The Greek word for abide, may know, means like to stay, like to exist, to dwell in this place, in a given state. And I think that's really important for us to recognize, like it's stopping and it's existing with Jesus. And Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. And the closest kind of Old Testament tie to this we see is we see the place where God's presence dwelled, where it remained. We see that in the tabernacle. We see that in the temple. We see that in Jesus. And now he's inviting us into that. All right. So there's two results uh, from abiding. Um, The first one is pruning. Now, pruning is different than fruitless being cut off. Fruitless being cut off, thrown into the fire, that's because there's no life in it. Pruning means there actually is life in you. It's not because you're doing something wrong. It's because you're doing something right. And it might actually feel the same. It might feel like death. It might feel like this is terrible. I am losing something. I hate this. But what it actually is, is God coming in and saying, you're bearing fruit. This is awesome. You're going to bear even more fruit. We're going to cut away some of this stuff. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a terrible, terrible gardener, so I can't speak with authority here, so I apologize. I've got one tree in my backyard that I've not killed. That's the, the one. The one. And, 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 and I really wanted it to, to survive. When, when I moved into our house, our backyard was literally just wild. It was crazy. There was 30 feet deep of bamboo from the fence 
you know, like invading my yard, coming towards my house. And it took two years to cut out all that bamboo and dig it out. It was, it was a fight. But there was this one lilac bush that I really liked. It was really pretty, but it had been allowed to go nuts again. Nobody had ever pruned it. And so it was dying under the weight of its own growth. Uh, it, it had grown out crooked and sideways, and it was, it was breaking off about halfway through because of the way it had grown out there. And I thought, man, I love lilacs. They're so pretty. There was some on the road I grew up on when I was a kid. Like, I really want this to survive. And I kind of, I don't know if you've ever done this. Uh, I can't help it. You anthropomorphize, you know, those things that you love. I remember apologizing to it as I was cutting things off of it. Like, I'm so sorry. Whack. <laughs> oh, this has got to hurt. Whack. <laughs> until there was nothing but just this one tiny shoot coming up out of the stump, just this one. And I thought, I have no idea if you're gonna make it. I hope you're gonna make it, but I don't know if you're gonna make it. And over the years, it's made it. But it's taken me going back time and again and finding the other saplings that wanna take off and having to take them out because they will rob from the, the good fruit. But so far, that one, as long as I keep the others cut back, that one has just gotten healthier and healthier. And that's, that's us. We're all over the place. We're all over the place. We're constantly going out there, and, and, and it takes listening to God and saying, God, what part of my life needs to be pruned? And what part of my life do you want to move me towards? Where, where do you want to send the grace? And it's such a beautiful thing because as much as it's painful, I mean, pruning any kind of plant, you are taking off things that are dead, but sometimes you're taking off things that are alive too, and you're ripping them away so that there's room for better fruit, for more growth. And when we have that in our lives, sometimes it just feels, it feels like death. It feels terrible. But there's something about recognizing, like, no, I'm going to abide. I'm going to remain in Christ, and he's going to do something through this. I was thinking of an example in my own life, and I had a season right around the time when I started working at the church. I'd been leading young adults for three years at the time, and that moving toward it becoming my job. And I was doing really well, or I felt like I was doing really well, really well physically, spiritually, emotionally, all these things. It was training for Hood to Coast, and then I got in a car accident. And then five months later, I got in another car accident. And both of them, I was in a stopped car and hit by someone else. Just, I had no control over the situation. And then I got really sick, and then it just fell apart. I got so sick that I couldn't sit up for a while without almost passing out. I started getting tingling and pain up my arms and my legs and like this weird tingling in my eyes and I couldn't use my hands. I couldn't turn a doorknob. I couldn't, I couldn't go to church. I couldn't lead young adults. It felt like everything was just stripped away from me. And I finally made it to church one day, was able to like, you know, get up and was sitting in in one of the chairs and I didn't have the strength to hold my coffee cup. I had to put it down because it, it hurt and I couldn't, I couldn't hold my coffee cup. And we had this moment and it was talking about sacrificing and giving what you have to the Lord. And I just remember, I just, I just broke down in tears. I was like, Lord, I have nothing. I feel like everything has been taken away. I don't have my health. I haven't worked because I, so I don't have any finances. I don't, I don't have anything to give you. I have no ministry. I'm not any good to anybody. And in that moment, when everything was pulled back and torn away, was when I was really able to hear the Lord at a deeper level than I ever had before in this place of my heart. And he was like, Nicole, all I want is you. All I want is your heart. And that is what it took for it to click for me. Like, oh, I am not the outcome of what I do. I am a daughter of the Most High. I'm chosen. And it doesn't matter if I have anything to give or I have everything to give. That doesn't make a difference. My identity is not in what I do. My identity is in who I am as daughter. Paul describes what pruning uh, feels like in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. He says this, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises us from the dead. I love this picture because it, it does feel like a death sentence. It feels like something is dying. And sometimes something has to die to bring more life. And that, that pruning can be painful, but there's, there's two things I wanna 
want to pay attention to here. First of all, uh, he's not quiet about it. I like that. He, he wants his brothers and sisters to know. He says, I don't want you to be unaware of the afflictions we've experienced. Sometimes we think suffering in silence is, is somehow more holy, and it's not. Uh, sometimes we need to tell people, I'm being pruned. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> and then that, this, the other piece is the description where he says, it felt like a sentence of death, but it wasn't. It was actually so that I would rely, so I would go back to that source and abide, so I would go back to the source of God. And, and that, that idea is, is explained even one more time by the, by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 11. He says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The next thing that, uh, that is a, an outcome of abiding is joy, joy. He says very clearly here that uh, I'm telling you these things and what is gonna come from them is joy. And that's important because this isn't a new law. Like, oh, okay, all right, uh, striving isn't the thing, abiding is the thing, so I'm gonna abide. Abide, I say. <laughs> Two hour quiet times. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna memorize twenty verses this week. I'm gonna I'm gonna bite so hard I'll be the best abider this world has ever seen. Uh, we love winning. <laughs> we love it. We love conquering. Uh, this is a joy thing. This is a joy thing. Uh, from this, if this isn't bringing joy, then we it might be it might we might be doing it wrong. Uh, there's also gonna be pain, so don't feel like if there's pain, I'm doing it wrong. If there's pain, it probably means you're doing it right. But there should also be this joy, like, oh man, this hurts a little bit. I don't know what's going on. My health is going away. My finances are going away. But I'm also more connected to Jesus than I've ever been in my life. I'm more reliant on him. I've heard more from him than I've ever heard. Like, I don't know why this feels this way. But you know what? That, that's fruitfulness and that's pruning together. <laughs> so what, is that, what does that look like in community? We're a community that abides together. So John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in the Father, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another." So, just a reminder, when is he speaking to these guys? He's speaking to them right before his crucifixion. And he knows not just what's happening immediately, but he knows what's going to be in their future. He knows that this is going to be his church, and that his church is going to suffer persecution and loss, and they're going to be driven from cities. And he's telling them what they need. First, to be connected to him. Second, to be connected to one another, to love one another, and to do it, listen, to do it the same way that he loved them. Uh, love has a definition. Love is not undefined. Larry Norman, one of my favorite Christian artists, I loved Larry Norman, uh, he, he wrote a song uh, a long time ago about uh, the, the, the loss or the breakup of his marriage, and it was kind of a repentant song about the mistakes that he'd made. And, and he had this phrase there, he said, uh, as though youth were my invention, as though love lay undefined, to stay free was my intention, to stay young and unconfined. So I held my pride above you, yes, what a fool was I, holding back those words, I love you, and letting out the words goodbye. I just, that, that is brilliant poetry. 
And, and it's so true. He's saying, as if love didn't have a definition, as if it wasn't defined by the cross exactly what it means to love somebody. To love someone is to choose the highest and best for them over yourself. Um, don't, I, I have teenage daughters, so this kind of stuff is on my mind a lot right now. Uh, don't come around me and tell me you love my daughter and you're not doing what's best for her. Uh, Enough said. (laughs) Papa Bear will get very angry. Love means something. It means something. Uh, And the definition of love is, is found in Jesus Christ as he lays his life down for us. And he says to them, look, guys, you don't know what's coming. I know what's coming. You know what you're gonna need? You're gonna need me, and you're gonna need to love one another. And the the things that really marked the church, the things that you find in the book of Acts, is they loved Jesus and they loved one another. That's that's this. Resurrection community lays down their lives for one another. Resurrection community knows what the Father is saying and obeys it. Resurrection community did not choose itself the community was chosen by God. I, I, I know we tend to hear these words, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and think of them very individually, and that's good. They are true of you as an individual, that you didn't choose God, you didn't go seeking for him, he actually went seeking for you, found you, and saved you. That's true. But it's also true of everyone else in your community. Do you hear me? You know, what, you know the implications of that? That means the person in your community who annoys you the most was chosen by God to be there. He wants that person in your life. Sometimes we think we can, we can self-select some of this and, and choose like, well, I, I, I want a group of people like this or I want a group of people like that. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. God's going to bring in there the people that he wants in your life that will help him do some of the pruning. And sometimes that is a painful process, but it's his process, not ours. And it's through abiding that we get the capacity to be able to do this, to be able to love well. We just can't do it on our own. We're, we are not capable. So, so this commandment to go and to love one another, it is an outcome of abiding. It is me spending time with Jesus that allows me to go and extend his love to others. And, it is, and, and to engage in community in an authentic way, to really love each other, is a really painful thing because we exist in a time when you, you can look at people and you know they're going to hurt you because whether we like it or not, we're all broken and that is a piece of authentic community is getting hurt sometimes and hurting others sometimes. And if we're doing this in our own strength, it's not going to last and we're not going to be able to do it. So this, this component of engaging, of loving one another, it comes from abiding. And we have to spend that time with Jesus to be able to love like him. So he's going to finish uh, here with the description, because what you see happen, if you look, is he's actually kind of laying out a worldview as well. And and part of any healthy, well-rounded worldview has to take into account all the players. And he's describing himself, he's describing the community of believers, but he's also describing the world. And, And basically he's saying the world will want to sever your connection to me, but they can't. John 15, 18 says, if the world hates you, know it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they've seen and hated both me and my Father. But the word that's written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, 
whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. So if you ever wonder where does your witness come from, it comes from being with the Father. That's it. What the world needs is people who have been with Jesus. That's what you find all through the book of Acts, as a matter of fact, is people who have been with Jesus. Uh, in, in Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized they had been with Jesus. I don't know how you feel about being called common or uneducated. It's not really a compliment. But they, they realized, oh, this isn't, this isn't a Peter and John thing. This is, there's something going on in their life that's bigger than them. And it seems like what it is is the fact that they've been with Jesus. What the world needs is people who have clearly been with Jesus. So there's uh, this, this week with what happened in Florida, um, there's a grieving and there's, and there's pain and uh, I've been mostly on a media fast but when you know, news like this happens I kind of jumped back in to read some news and to find some stuff out and I, I read this article by an author, uh, Glennon Doyle Melton um, and she started a dialogue with her, her, uh, her kid's teacher over long division and her inability to help her kid do it. <laughs> she said, this stuff you're sending home with my child, they tell me it's math, but I don't recognize it. <laughs> help me. And she goes, oh, I can help your kid if they need help. And I'm like, no, 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 my kid understands it. I don't. <laughs> and so she came to, to school, and the teacher said, let me help you, you know, show you how we're doing this. And, and after about an hour, she said, I, I, I figured out, finally, what they were doing. And then I started a conversation with the teacher. How's it going? What's it like being a teacher these days? Uh, you know, what's it like trying to, to mold these kids into good citizens and good people. And she said the teacher uh, described something that she did every week. Uh, and maybe some of you have known about this, but it was new to me. She says she asks them who they would like to sit with next week and who's been an exceptional class citizen that week. She goes, they just nominate three people. Who would you like to sit with and who has been an exceptional class citizen this week? And she said, I don't do this. They think I'm doing it so I can make a seating chart. I'm not doing it to make a seating chart. I'm doing it to figure out connections. Because what I find out is who is being liked, who's being loved, who's being connected to, and who is being left out. And she said, some weeks I'll find that everyone requests to be around this one kid. And then next week, nobody does. And I know, uh-oh, something's gone wrong. So I've got some kids in the class that nobody has ever asked to sit by them. And I know, oh no, something's being done to them. Maybe they're being bullied. You see where the connections are. And the, the author of the, the story, and she said, how long have you been doing this? She said, I've done it every week since Columbine. Every week. And I just thought, man, that's powerful. That is powerful. There's a teacher. Believe it or not, I don't know. But she understands the power of these connections. She understands that uh, when someone is cut off, they quickly wither and die. She understands the, uh, the pain of being alone and the power of being together. Um, I don't know <laughs> where you are right now in your connections. Um, but pain, pain is a good indicator of something, right? Doctors know pain means something. Um, and what I see in the scripture is at least three kinds of pains being described. The first pain is uh, burning, fruitlessness. God has to cut something off and throw it into a fire. It doesn't have any life, it's dead. The next pain, though, isn't from fruitlessness. It's from fruit, and it's pruning. Uh, it, though, will lead to life. It's the good kind of pain, right? It's the workout pain. This hurts, but I'm getting stronger. 
And then this other third pain that he's describing is hate. <laughs> um, hate is painful. If, if you're feeling that right now, I'm sorry. And what there is on offer this morning is abiding. I, I'd love to think, um, I'd love to think that there, there was something legislative, something we could do. But what I've learned is uh, that those things should happen. But all that rules can do, all that the law can do, is keep us from doing something wrong, right? Rules are kind of like handcuffs. They keep us from doing a wrong thing. But they don't change the human heart. The only thing that changes the human heart is Jesus, because he's the only one that has resurrection life. I want to ask the worship team to go ahead and come back up now. Um, if you don't have that connection and that abiding, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Yesterday, we, we buried a father. Um, if we could have him on the stage this morning, if somehow we could bring him back to preach a message to you, just what would you say? Wouldn't that be a powerful message? What do you think he would say was important right now? Malachi chapter four, and we'll, we'll end here and, and take communion, says this. At the end of the Old Testament, the father uses this, this analogy one more time before sending his son. And he uses it through the prophet Malachi, and he says this. He says, behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evil doers will be stubble. I don't know about you, but I kind of want that. <laughs> I'm kind of sick of evil and people getting hurt. But I also am wise enough to know to be afraid of that. <laughs> that if God comes in judgment, he comes and judges all. And none of us are left unjudged unless we're found in him. And that's the description that you find. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. So Father, uh, this morning we just ask, would you help us examine our life? And maybe right now it's just through the prism of pain and where the hurt is. But God, would you, would you give us discernment and wisdom, wisdom to know where to work with the good vine dresser, where to let things be cut off, and where to make our healthy, abiding love connections with you and with one another. And God, when you come, and you come in judgment, we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over our communities, over our schools, and over our families, and over our personal lives. Because it's only the blood that saves.